Okay, guys. Welcome to the Science Cafe. So to go, tonight, they actually told me I should introduce myself for those of you who don't know who I am. I'm Sarah Wyatt. I'm a professor in environmental and plant biology. Um, I'm your speaker in two weeks. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. What else do you need to know? I'm the vice president. I'll get there. I'm the vice president of Sigma Xi, which is the Honorary Research Society. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is, I'd highly recommend you go to Sigma Xi, which is XI, Sigma Xi, uh, com, and take a look at what we do and what Sigma Xi stands for. Um, but let's get back to tonight. So tonight we actually have t-shirts. We always have t-shirts, almost. These are this year's t-shirts. You might see them around. We have a limited number of these t-shirts, and the t-shirts typically go to people who ask questions or answer questions that the speaker suggests or interacts in some way, okay? So limited number, so you gotta ask stuff early. All right, a couple of other announcements before I let TJ get started. Um, October 5th, at 6.30 and 8 p.m., there will be a showing of PhD, the movie, okay? It's in Memod. Uh, it's sponsored by the Ohio University Graduate College and the Division of Student Affairs. So if you're interested, it's kind of a fun movie. I saw it two years? Okay. Okay, 6.30, did you catch that? 6.30 is the first PhD, the movie, the original, and then it, Eight o'clock is the sequel to that, so you can come and watch both of them at one time. All right, so that's sponsored by the Graduate College. Next week, we have a ca na next week, one week from today, we have a cafe conversation. It's Rich Richard Vetter, who's going to discuss Americans' leaders. You're harming our future. So it's about it's a talk about student debt and the failing education system, something we might all be interested in. Um, so tonight, we have Dr. Timothy Siders. He is an assistant professor in mechanical engineering in the Russ College, and he's gonna talk about 3D printers. And take it away. It's all yours. Can everybody hear me? No, you're not live. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Much better, all right. You never realize how much you hate the sound of your own voice until you're speaking in one of these. Normally, I'm talking at my students. That's far preferable. So um, that was a joke. Off to a good start. <laughs> so I uh, want to talk about 3D printing. I want to give you a little bit of background on me first so that you can know that you can trust me a little bit on manufacturing matters. So I actually come from industry. Before I came back from my doctorate, I worked for General Electric, a number of other companies doing different roles, anywhere from process design, working on a manufacturing floor, to designing machinery that worked on that floor to optimizing processes. Then I started my own business, which was something completely different. Developed some new technologies, did some uh, analysis, did some graduate work, wound up coming back for a doctorate and, uh, and decided that I just loved Athens way too much. And uh, so my wife and I have stayed here. But uh, I've done a lot of work in manufacturing and in kind of startup business stuff. And so that's always kind of on my mind. So I'm really interested in this idea behind 3D printing. Does anybody has anybody in here ever heard of 3D printing? Probably none of you, right? <laughs> That's why you came. Uh, so somebody, can somebody explain to me what 3D printing is? Anybody? What do you got? You can print out a 3D object. How odd. OK. So this is the idea that we can uh, lay up material in layers. And we've got a, a number of different examples of 3D prints here. Over here, I've got my very able assistant, Cody, who is sitting next to a 3D printer that looks like it's functioning about as well as it normally does. Um, so, uh, but he's got some examples of 3D printed stuff over there. I've got some examples of 3D printed things up here. Um, and so it's the idea that we can lay up, uh, this is an example of the head, of, is this a femoral head? What is this? Okay, so this, yeah, so this is, um, the head of a, a long bone that's been uh, 
we've taken a 3D scan of it and then made a 3D model out of that and then fed that into a 3D printer. And it lays a very thin filament and melts it as it goes. And the computer tells it where to lay that material. And it can build up structures. And so it takes filament like this and feeds it into an extruder head that extrudes it out into a really thin layup. And then we can print all sorts of different shapes. This lends itself to a lot of very interesting concepts. Uh, anybody know how old 3D printing actually is? Anybody? Who thinks 3D printing is less than five years old? OK, less than 10. Less than 20. Less than 30. OK, it's, it's about 30 years old this year. Um, it was invented in the middle mid-80s, and the idea has actually been around for quite a while. We now, uh, 3D printing is one of a number of different technologies that we are now becoming uh, uh, accustomed to referring to as additive manufacturing with the, uh, that is contrasted from subtractive manufacturing. Uh, so normally, what we would consider to be kind of a traditional manufacturing process would be something like this. This was originally just a rod of a single diameter, and I put it in a lathe, and I cut off some material, and so I removed that material. It's called a subtractive process. So we're going to be talking about additive processes today and what they mean for the future. So what is this 3D printing stuff, and why should I care? It's a valid question. Why is this important? Uh, so I'm going to read you a quote from 3dprint.com. It's very interesting, and it's kind of the crux of the issue I want to discuss today. So I apologize. I'm going to read to you. No one has a functioning crystal ball in front of them, I assume, but a good guess would be a machine which can practically build anything its user desires, all on the molecular and eventually atomic levels. And somebody's talking about what kind of the future is of 3D printing. And he goes on to say, if things go as planned, these machines have the potential to do to chemistry what 3D printing has done to engineering, making it fast, less complicated, and accessible to pretty much anyone. That's kind of a bold statement. Um, so the implication here is that 3D printing represents kind of, some might call it the democratization of technology, the idea that anybody can have access to being able to make stuff. How many of you in this room uh, have operated a machine tool and could chuck up a piece of aluminum in a lathe and turn it down? I've got at least a couple of students in here who better raise their hands. <laughs> Excellent, very good. But not many people. Okay, this, is, this isn't what we would call highly accessible because it takes skilled training to make something like this. Uh, has anybody here operated a 3D printer? Okay, lots of people. Uh, in fact, some people who said that they couldn't turn something like this on a lathe. So you raised your hand. Could you make this on a 3D printer? Well, probably not to these tolerances, but could you make this rough shape on a 3D printer? Sure, absolutely. Does that take any advanced knowledge to do, aside from a little bit of playing around with the printer? Not really. Right. Okay, so ability to use a computer. Uh, there's a, an online space, there's Thingiverse, which is just basically an online repository of bunches of 3D models. If it exists, probably you can find a model of it on Thingiverse. And you can download it and print it, and hooray, you've got your part. Um, so this is very interesting because it has certain implications, like made in the USA by robots. <laughs> the future of American manufacturing. Complete automation. And this is the, uh, the general implication of a lot of the people in the 3D printing community who are looking at the possibilities, the capabilities, the opportunities with 3D printing as we go forward. On the converse side, I would say, uh, as Israel just said, making something to this tolerance, you could probably do something close on a 3D printer. It would be a very expensive 3D printer, and it would probably take a lot of post-processing, and it wouldn't look exactly like this. So you know, why is that? What, is, what, what effect does that have? So now for something completely different. I want you to turn to somebody next to you, and I want, to dis I want you to discuss for a moment something that you are really good at. Everybody is good at something. OK, discuss with the people around you or somebody next to you. I, I assume that you're here with a friend or friends or complete strangers are fine, too. It's fine. Um, you can just tell them your life story and all of your greatest fears and, uh, and something that you're super good at. Go ahead.
So who in here is good at something? Four of you. Fantastic. No, seriously. Who in here is good at something? Everybody's got to be good at something. What are you good at? Okay. So you work with your hands, you make jewelry. Okay. I can't say that I'm good at that. I'd probably be very bad at that. What are you good at? Say that again. What kind of drawing? Art? Okay. Very cool. I do a different kind of drawing. It's, it's far more boring. What are you good at? What's that? You can juggle. I cannot juggle. These are great examples. So far, all examples of things that I have absolutely no aptitude for. What are you good at? Say that again. Texting correct sentences. We've got an English major in the house. Fantastic. And they came to an engineering talk. This is just amazing. I apologize in advance for any grammatical errors in my presentation. So um, here's a video of Usain Bolt. He is extremely good at choppy video. Uh, he is extremely good at running very fast. He's terrific at it. Um, anybody think they could do well in a race against Usain Bolt? Maybe we have some track members here and there. No? No? Nothing? OK. Yeah, I definitely couldn't. Not built for that. Um, so Usain Bolt, very good at what he does. Uh, now, this is going to be kind of an older video, and I hope you like football. And you're going to have to watch it. It's a pretty quick video. This is of a guy who was nicknamed the refrigerator. <laughs> Anybody who, who's heard of the refrigerator? All the millennials in the audience have no idea who I'm talking about. <laughs> the refrigerator was named the refrigerator because he's the size of a refrigerator. He's gigantic. Two inches taller than me, 120 pounds bigger than me, the size of actually a refrigerator box. And he was known for being able to pick up people who were running toward him and throw them away like rag dolls, <laughs> like this. So, boom, oh, just kidding, ha! Ah! And just picks up probably a 200 pound receiver and just throws him. <laughs> okay, so who do you think would win in a pushing contest? Usain Bolt or the refrigerator? The refrigerator. <laughs> the refrigerator. Who do you think would win in a foot race? I don't think the refrigerator is going to keep, keep up. <laughs> nope, he's probably got a little bit too much mass. So the point is, everybody's good at something. Additive manufacturing is good at some things. It is amazing for some things, and it isn't great for other things. And understanding those differences is really important for us as we kind of participate in a society and talk about manufacturing. Okay, I just, I, I have to do this, I'm sorry. Everybody say it with me. We're going to say additive manufacturing on the count of three, okay? One, two, three. Additive manufacturing. Okay, I just got a room full of millennials to say the word manufacturing. Have you ever said that word before? <laughs> okay, how many of you have worked in a factory? How many of you were told in high school that working in a factory was a good thing? Okay, very few of us. Very few of us have, have been told that over the years. I was told through my entire school career that working in a factory was the worst possible end game for me, that I didn't want to work in manufacturing. And whatever I did, I want to get an office job. I want to be a professional. And the reality is that professionals work in manufacturing. What I found was I, I graduated from undergrad having worked already in manufacturing for two years, and I loved it. And it's what drives our economy. It's really super important. And 3D printing has the promise of eliminating all the need for understanding artisanship and all that stuff. Uh, it, that's kind of the tenet of a lot of people's discussions about 3D printing. It, the, what it's going to do is take that human element and finally remove it because we just want to get rid of it. And in some regards, I understand that completely. Uh, in other regards, that has implications for the future. Um, so, all that is to say, what is 3D printing really good at? And that slide is really just there to remind me to put up the next video. So I'm going to pause this video throughout. I apologize in advance. The, the resolution is not great. Um, the lighting isn't ideal here. But um, So 3D printing is not relegated to polymers alone. Uh, let's see if we can get there. So this is an example of a 3D printed metal structure. 
Uh, this is made of, I believe, titanium alloy. Ti it's called Ti-6-4. It's a pretty common titanium alloy used for high strength applications. It's used in aeronautic parts, parts of airplanes, where we really need lightweight, really strong materials. And you can't manufacture this any other way, this shape. There is really no other way to make that. Okay, so there are things that 3D printing is super good at. It is really, really good at putting internal voids in, customized structures. Uh, it is allowing engineers to design things that previously, the first thing that I would tell my machine design students, I'm looking at you, Mr. Adams, he's unfortunate enough to be in my class right now, so he's discovering how awful I treat my students. No, seriously, I love my students. Um, but even now, I will stress that when you design something, you need to design something that you can actually make. Uh, Mr. Debro and, and Mr. Pettit can attest to this. They've had me in the past. Um, because when I design something as a machine designer, as somebody who's creating something new, uh, it's really important that when I hand a print to a machinist, they don't look at me and go, no, try again. You know, part of my profession is understanding how we can make things. Uh, and so additive manufacturing gives us the ability to make geometries that we previously thought completely impossible. So this uh, thing that she is holding right there with all the funky curves in it uh, is a heat sink for a Formula One race car that they optimized for airflow. And they basically said, OK, computer, it's the name of a great album, another album. How many, <laughs> I, I have to ask, I'm sorry, all these asides. I have to, how many of you had to read what the, uh, the explanation for what Rage Against the Machine was? OK, thank you. Thank goodness. OK. So they had the computer simulate what would be ideal for the shape to transfer heat out of our engine block based on the airflow, based on the different things they had available. And then they said, OK, just make that shape. Fine. Whereas in the past, we would have had to say, OK, well, this is what I can work with. I've got kind of flat stock that I can machine some stuff out of, but I have to fit a tool in there if I'm going to do this. And so I've got to figure out how to make that into parts that fit together. And, and so it's a complex engineering problem, not just doing the analysis and making the analysis churn out, but then being able to physically make that thing. And that's no longer a concern as long as cost is no object. Sounds cheap, right? Um, so. We can do absolutely astounding things. And there, there's one more example that I want to show here in this, in this video. This is a video, so th these again are 3D printed metals, which we're usually taking a metal powder and laying it up. And so this is a really interesting thing. If I can, where did my cursor go? Oh dear. Anybody see my cursor? What's that? Aha, I see it. Thank you, Ethan. If she'll show this thing again. There it is. OK. <laughs> Fantastic. So this is a cup, a hip cup, for a hip replacement. Okay, one of the neat things about 3D printing is it doesn't cost me any extra to go from you to you to you to you to you. And if I can get accurate 3D models of the bone that I'm replacing, I can tailor them to you and you and you and you, and there's no extra cost. It costs the same. The cost of a 3D printed piece of work is dependent on the volume that I've laid down, not on the complexity of the part. I don't care about the complexity of the part, usually. There are still things that you can't do with a 3D printer very easily, like printing large undercuts, because you have to support it. So you actually have to design the supports, et cetera. This is designed with this spongy structure. They did that on purpose. They actually made the model so fine they could put that spongy structure in there so that when they implant that into your bone, your bone grows into the spongy structure. And they optimized it for that. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, for bio applications, bio biological devices, medical devices, the medical device industry, 3D printing is huge because now I can print new vertebrae for people. I can print human tissue. We're printing cells because cells can grow. And we can print living cells and, and have them multiply. And so we're printing them on things like sugar substrates and building up all sorts of different structures. There's a lot of promise there because we can do all sorts of stuff that you can't. I can't do that on a milling machine. I can, I can cut my finger on a milling machine. I know. I've done it before. Uh, but I can't create stuff the way that additive can. So you might be asking yourself why I titled my presentation the way I did. We'll get to it, I promise. So what is it really good at? 
Well, 3D printing is really good at, like I said, biological materials, because instead of cutting away, it's laying down. We can do that with cells. We can do that with all sorts of stuff. Uh, it can do nanoscale structures. They've printed literally lattices, kind of like the, the grid or, of beams in a building, on a nanoscale, so small that you can't really see it with a light microscope. You have to use an electron microscope, and even then, you know, seeing it's a little dodgy. Uh, and building up structures so that they respond mechanically. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and so what we could approximate someday with metals, and by someday I mean we're doing it right now, is this idea of, for example, human bone. It's spongy on the inside, stiff cortical structure on the outside. We can optimize that stuff. I can print weird geometries, weird shapes, stuff that I would have to figure out how to manufacture. Um, I have an example around here somewhere. I don't know what I did with it. Just kidding, I left it on my desk. Um, so we can print all sorts of different stuff. It's good for low volume prototyping, for entrepreneurs, technology development, huge deal. Uh, hard to work material, really, really important. Uh, if I'm making tooling, if I'm making uh, a forging tool that I'm going to then use to make a, a zillion parts, I'm gonna make that out of a super hard material that doesn't like to be cut, but I can lay it down with a laser and powder very easily. And again, the 3D printer doesn't care. And I can do what we call topological, <laughs> I can't even say it, topological optimization. Holy big words, Batman. What this means is I can actually make the material behave differently in different ways. I can make it conduct heat better in this direction than this direction, so it directs heat flux. I can direct mechanical properties, so it's stiff in this direction, but not in this direction. So it's strong in this direction, but not in this direction. I can do all sorts of stuff like that, all the way down to the molecular level. But it's not cheap. It's not cheap. So turn to somebody next to you and give it some thought for a moment. What could you do with a 3D printed part? Where do you see 3D printing as maybe having some application? Can you think of something that, huh, I wish that I could just print X. I wish that I could just make a part that does this. Go ahead, discuss. So if you could make anything, what would you make? You've got one. Very interesting. I haven't thought of that before. That's actually a really good idea. Somebody patent that. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this idea of customizable, I buy it and they can give me an electronic copy. You know, maybe, maybe I buy a, a vacuum, and if I need a part for my vacuum, I pay them a dollar to go download the part file, and I can just print myself a replacement part. Interesting. What would you make? Sure. I implants for, uh, for surgical uh, repair, replacements. What would you make? Money. <laughs> Money! <laughs> Finally, a capitalist in the audience. <laughs> Very good. You would probably make money. There are a lot of companies doing additive manufacturing, different things with 3D printing right now. I think she meant the actual money. Oh, you would print money. Oh. Well, I guess you could probably do that. But it 
wouldn't be as fun. What would you make? Prosthetics for wounded soldiers. We're already doing that. We're already making those. Organs. Already making those. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. I, he's not a plant, I promise. That's the very definition of a von Neumann machine. It's a machine that can re replicate itself. And uh, it's this idea of, uh, it was actually a kinematic machine that was uh, the brainchild of a guy by the name of von, von Neumann uh, 50 some odd years ago. And there is a 3D printer that you can do that with called the RepRap. And it's designed with all 3D printed parts that it is itself capable of 3D printing. And so it's a pretty neat machine. And we're, we're now to, okay, uh, it's Skynet and we are headed for Terminator. So we should probably be careful. What would you make? Uh, human brain. Human brain. Yeah, Very, oh, a model. Yeah. Okay, that's far less scary. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's living on my desk. Um, so uh, you, it is useful for physical models to hold, especially for people who do technology development and come up with ideas and want to see, okay, how might this function? Will this work? You just 3D print one. Make it really quick. It doesn't, doesn't cost much if you're doing it with plastic or something like that. Uh, so filament like this is, what, a dollar a pound-ish? Something like that? It, what is it per kilogram? 18 grams a dollar is way off. So it's more like, I don't know. I can't math. I'm an engineer. Interesting. So back to the future-ish. Hit the button and out pops the food that you want. Star oh, Star Trek. Sorry. I was... <laughs> and what would you make? Um, I've heard a, about a, someone who wanted to buy out an office building and use it to 3D print cars. Okay. And it has the ability to predict the, the time, but it's pretty fast. Okay. So 3D printing an entire vehicle. Interesting. Again, not a plant. Um, so <laughs> can I get a volunteer? You with the long hair. All right. So I apologize. I'm sure some of you can't see. Um, here's what we're going to do. You and I are going to have a little race. Come on up. Okay. <clears throat> this is a pretty simple shape, yes? Nothing too complicated about it. Okay. You're a 3D printer now. You're my 3D printer. You're a 3D printer, and I am a hot hammer forge. Just ask my wife. <laughs> so... You're my 3D printer, and here's what I want you to do. Here is your material stream, and I want you to piece by piece. Uh, she is turning so red right now. <laughs> it's hilarious. So I want you to piece by piece build this up as fast as you humanly can, but you have to pick up one piece at a time, okay? Yep, I want you to take that, and I want you to piece by piece build up this shape, one piece at a time. I win. Thank you. <laughs> it's not that it was a bad 3D printer. It's not that he was not uh, good at his job. It's that his job wasn't what he was good at. He was Usain Bolt, and this process was the refrigerator. Okay? So I would never make a car with a 3D printer. Ever. I would make a model of a car with a 3D printer if I wanted to figure out, okay, I want to I wanna conceptualize the best shape for this car, perfectly suited for a 3D printer, to do prototyping. The moment we get into production parts, there are a lot of reasons that 3D printing right now isn't really tailored for that for kind of mass consumption stuff. Cars where you're going to make maybe 1,000 pieces or 10,000 pieces or 10 million pieces doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and, and we'll kind of see why. Um, so uh, fire away. So, so yeah, go ahead. Can you actually 3D print them all? And then, have the and then have the assembly folks put it together. Could you? Uh, so the question was, could you actually 3D print every component in a car and have it work? Who says yes? Yeah, you could probably do that. Who says, no, I don't think you could do that? The answer is maybe. It's a good engineering answer. Okay, I, I, I give this to my students all the time. Eh, it depends. 
uh, just because I don't want to be wrong. I'm a professor, right? Just dodge the question. No, the reality is that there's a lot that goes into it, um, and it's difficult to say. Right now, 3D printing, especially for production parts and especially using what we'll call high-performance engineering materials, isn't really up to par compared with some of the other processes that are out there. So when I said that I was a forging press, what I did was I deformed this material. And that deformation is important. We'll get to that here in just a moment. So we've talked about what 3D printing is really good at, and it is a fantastic, fantastic process. What are its current limitations? Right now, cost. The, the wonderful thing about 3D printing is it doesn't cost you any extra to make a really complex part. The bad thing about it is it doesn't cost you any less to make a really simple part. It is expensive, any way you look at it. It is a very expensive process. Uh, it is very slow. As, as we saw here, this is a very simplistic example, but the, the reality is that if I want to build something up, the more accurately I need to build it, the smaller my feedstock needs to be, and therefore the slower it needs to be built. And so it's, it's very difficult. We need some breakthrough technologies to make this even begin to be kind of order of magnitude competitive with any other process and speed. Uh, but that's not what we're using it for. We're not using it for high production stuff. Uh, we're not using it for high volume stuff. This is for prototyping, it's for one-offs, it's for making, you know, the, I'm gonna make 30 of these and they're all gonna go on the space shuttle and then on a rack for spare parts. You know, um, different things that we can do with it, but volume manufacturing doesn't make any economic sense from uh, an additive manufacturing perspective. Uh, Material characteristics. Right now, I can't get the same material characteristics out of a 3D printed part. Even a laser-centered metal part is going to be weaker than its forged counterpart. And we'll talk about how that works in a moment. The other uh, really big one is engineering standards. Right now, all of our engineering standards, and I know this is, this is borderline really boring, so I apologize. Even my students kind of cringe when I say standards. So when I bought this piece of steel, there are at least four engineering standards that I'm aware of that this piece of steel had to be conformant to for the supplier to sell it to the person who sold it to me. And for that to be a legal transaction and to say that this meets the spec for this material. It has to do with the tolerances, the minimum strength, the microstructure. There's all sorts of stuff that goes into this that you might not think about when you pick up a piece of steel at Lowe's that you're gonna use to kind of buttress your gutter. Uh, but the reality is that we have a lot of standards that we have to remain conformant to. Right now, our standards don't make any allowances for additive manufacturing. They don't, they, they have to, any aluminum has to be cold worked. I can't do that with an additive process right now. I, I actually have to stretch the material. That doesn't make any sense. I just want to lay it up and be done with it. And uh, so from that perspective, we need to work on our engineering standards in order to allow additive manufacturing to even become mainstream. But before that, we need an understanding of what the standards ought to be. So, how many of you have heard the phrase, you can get it good, fast, cheap, pick two? Okay, well, a lot of us have heard that. You get it good, fast, cheap, pick two. But <laughs> define fast. Who thinks that, uh, okay, based on this, one part every, um, every five seconds is fast? Okay, one part every second. <laughs> this, this is pretty fast, okay? It totally depends on what you're making. You know, if I'm carving this very fine-tuned part with very tight tolerances, it might take hours and hours of machine time. But this is ultimately an engineering design problem, and it's something that I kind of enjoy. Sorry. I keep forgetting that I am remoted into my computer. So... This is my last video, I promise. I do apologize. So this is a video of a high-speed metal stamping process. We're going to skip ahead here. And I apologize if it's really hard to see how many parts are coming out of this thing. They are shooting out of there at about 40 parts per second. And this is making those out of sheet that fast. It's just stamping. It's just sitting there stamping. Stamping metal, sheet, sheet metal parts. It doesn't get cheaper than this. Stamped sheet metal is probably the cheapest process that you can think of. Uh, it's really easy to do. We can actually make decently complicated shapes by stamping parts and then bending them and doing all sorts of things with them. But this is a huge capital investment of equipment to do just that. 
and you've got to buy dyes that do just that. And there's tens of thousands of dollars in that development. So that's what I think of when I think fast. OK, now, so those parts, I think we, we would all agree that thing's making parts pretty fast, yes? Everybody think, OK. Uh, are they cheap? Yeah, per part, those are probably less than a penny a part, depending on what material they're making them out of. I mean, it, and unbelievably low cost, unbelievably fast. OK, um, good. Are those good parts? I assume so. If, if good, good enough. Good enough. Another uh, of my favorite phrases is that perfect is the enemy of good enough. I'm convinced that an engineer coined that phrase. So define good. So again, discuss with somebody next to you. Think about a thing that you have, whether it's an iPhone or a toilet or something that functions really well, that you just think, wow, that, that works. I think that's a good design. Discuss. What works well? So what do you think? Who can think of something that works well? Can you think of something that works well? Okay. Who can think of something that works well? You work pretty well. All right, this is interesting because bone is actually a really smart material. Do you know it fixes itself? I've, I've broken one, I know that. It's actually fixing itself right now. Right now, your bone is detecting where you're using it. It's going through and sending cutting osteons to cut out the broken up material and laying down new material and mineralizing the bone around it. Dr. Cotton here is laughing because he taught me all that. So bone is doing that. Bone is an amazingly smart material. The human body is in itself an engineering feat, believe me. What else works really well? What works really well? Your, P your PlayStation 4. Figured that would come up at some point. What do you think? Xbox Your Xbox 360. <laughs> Battle of the PlayStations. What else works really well? My glasses. Your glasses. Okay. They, they perform the function for which they are designed. They don't have to necessarily be advanced. And it's just the properties of their function that define their beauty. So I've always held that how you hold a hammer defines how people look at you with a hammer. Because if you hold a hammer like this, people say, oh, yeah, he's talking about a hammer. If you hold a hammer like this, <laughs> people <laughs> So this is, this is a hammer, not a complex device, right? Not a real complicated device. How would you judge whether a hammer works well before I smack myself in the face with it? I can hit something with it. Ostensibly, a hammer sometimes screws if I'm lazy. What else? Balance. So how that feels as I swing it so it doesn't, you know, fly off the handle. Durability. I don't want it to break. As much as I love breaking things, I'm an engineer, it's what I do. Uh, having this thing function as, it, as it's designed is really just, okay, um, it needs to weigh something, it needs to be able to hit things, and it needs to be able to, it needs to be maybe harder than the nail, right? and stronger than the nail, ostensibly. Uh, that's it. So, what's that? It needs to be pleasing to the eye, which I think this hammer really is. This is, I mean, this is just a, this is a beauty of a tool. So, you haven't worked in construction, that's all your constraints. <laughs> I, I have not. 
you want reduced vibrations to the handle, hence the rubber grip here, and actually hence the geometry of this particular hammer. This is a wrench. This is also not a complex device. Okay, pretty simple. Would you 3D print either of these? Yeah, who said yeah? Okay, why? Because it's 3D? Okay, okay, interesting. What do you think? It's metal. Cool, we can 3D print metal. We can 3D print metal, but I wouldn't 3D print either of these. This is made through a process called sand casting. We've been doing sand casting for about 6,000 years. Uh, pretty old process, forging how this was made. So sand casting, pretty simple. You make a sand mold that looks like the negative of this or the female of this, and you melt metal and you pour it in the hole. That's it. Done, there's my part. Okay, this is cast iron, it's kind of heavy. This is forged seal. This was put hot into a set of dyes that are shaped like the female of this, and then they took that dye and whoosh, hit it. And so if you talk to a forger today, they'll say they're in the industry of heat it and beat it, is what they do. They, they beat it with a hammer and make hammers. It's like a von Neumann machine. Um, so it's more than just geometry, though. It's more than just making the right shape. We said this needs to be strong enough, right? OK. Um, here I've got a piece of Play-Doh. I got some very strange looks in Walmart today as I was walking out with an arm full of Play-Doh. They're like, what's the grown man doing with the, that's very weird. I've put some dots on this Play-Doh that are evenly spaced. OK, everybody see the dots? Anybody not see the dots on there? OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my trusty anvil. This is just a piece of, I think this is 304 stainless steel. I'm probably going to put this right in the center of the table, lest I break the table. OK, so we can see that the dots are all basically the same size, yes? So I'm going to place it here on my anvil. I'm going to take my piece of carbon steel and smush it. Now, what happened to the dots in the middle? Not much. They got a little bit bigger. What about the dots on the outside? They stretched. Right? This is an example of a crank arm out of, say, a car. This is a, a crank arm from an engine that would hold a piston. And it's a little difficult to see on this screen, but if you look very closely, you can see that the grains of the structure align to the material. That actually makes that crank stronger than before it was formed. So if I just printed the material, if I just make that material and don't do anything to it, uh, it, it has kind of an OK strength. The moment I work that material, it becomes much stronger. And I can actually establish preferential grain lines so it's stronger in this way than it is in this way. And I didn't have to 3D print that. I can do that just as fast as I can smash that in a forge. So certain things lend themselves to that. If you 3D printed that part, you would never get sufficient fatigue life to run your engine. You would run that engine maybe a few thousand cycles, and it would die. Uh, what about electric cars? What about electric cars? What about 3D printing them? OK. So can you think of any other parts in a car that might experience cyclical loading? So uh, loads that repeat themselves, things like bouncing down the highway on your frame, uh, those types of things tend to kill very quickly parts that don't have good microstructural properties. That's one of the things that 3D printing right now is having trouble establishing. And that's one of the things that my research is trying to help. So we're working with some of the forging industry and we're working with some of the 3D printing industry to try and bring them together and say, what's a new process where we get the best of both worlds? And so maybe we can come up with something new. Maybe, maybe, that's, where, maybe that's what they were doing. Uh, there are some efforts out there just to 3D print the car to see what happens. It's kind of a, kind of a press thing, but you, you're never going to do that for a production car. I wouldn't 3D print car parts, but I might 3D print parts of a plane because I have to lightweight it. I got to get rid of all the mass inside. Can can you 3D print maybe that microstructure into it? Very very slowly in a way. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, sometimes you have to work the material. So geometry is just printing the right shape isn't enough you would be astounded to find how many of the things that you encounter every day were engineered for their manufacturing process to make exactly the part that you need. Uh, one example is crank arms 
they have adjusted the chemistry in this steel and tweaked maybe the phosphorus in the steel. Steel's mostly iron, but you might have 0.1% or 0.2% weight phosphorus or silicon. And these things do different things to the solid chemistry when we work the steel and when we forge the steel. And there's a lot of optimization work that has gone in over our 100 years of real metallurgical understanding. Uh, and that is built into things that you use all day, every day. From the lenses in your glasses and the glass that goes into that, I actually hail originally from the glass industry. There's a lot of chemistry that goes into that. There's a lot of physics that goes into that, and the materials testing. It's more than just printing the right shape. And so different things like forging gives us a stronger part and better fatigue properties than, say, casting the part. So while almost all of us drive cars with sand cast engine blocks, almost all of us also drive cars with forged crank arms. And so, I'm going backward. So eventually, we get to this idea that 3D printing is not going to eliminate all of our manufacturing base. It is not going to change everything about the world, but it is really significant. And there's some amazing stuff we can do with it. But it's another tool in an engineer's tool belt to design something new. And it allows us to do all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, there are some social issues with this, and this is really the interesting part of the presentation, especially for the non-engineers in the audience who are tired of me talking about science. On the right, you have a picture of the B-29 Super Fortress. Okay, this was the jewel, the crown jewel of the Army Air Corps in World War II uh, for the U.S. military. Uh, this is basically what helped us win the war over Japan. Um, and th this was our strategic bomber. This allowed us to conduct bombing runs way, way, way far away from our bases. Uh, and Russia didn't have a strategic bomber during World War II. Now, they were our allies during World War II-ish. We had kind of a strange relationship with them. I can't talk, I, I'm sorry, I can't give a presentation without talking about history. My wife is a historian. I get in trouble if I, if I don't. So, so there was one instance where we landed our bombers on one of their airfields, and they made the Tupolev 4. Do you see any resemblance? <laughs> okay, this is an example. This is a very prominent example of reverse engineering. Okay? So one of the prominent social issues with 3D printing, the great thing about it is everybody can do it because you don't have to necessarily have a lot of skill. One of the less wonderful things about it is everybody can do it and you don't necessarily have to have a lot of skill. So what do you think about this for society? Does, does this have any bearing? Am I just talking to myself? Maybe I, I do this, I'm a, I'm a professor. What do you think? Somebody printed an AR-15. Somebody printed an AR-15, which is a, a rifle, if you don't know. It, totally, in this case, the, if you're thinking about the same person that I am, it was, it's legal. Uh, if you wanna make your own rifle, if you're allowed to own one, then there's no reason you couldn't make one yourself, but you can print one, and that doesn't require any skill. So that's a different discussion. Very interesting. So the question was, doesn't it require some skill to do some 3D printing? Doesn't re this require some specialized knowledge about the machine? What do you think, Gary? Right. So the, the crux of what he said was, basically, we're trying to simplify the controls. We're trying to make this easier and accessible. And there are a lot of good reasons to do that. We have to cope with, and we do this really with our freedom in any respect, we have to cope with this balance between we want people to be able to do stuff, but as a result, people are able to do stuff, right? Um, we love the information accessibility that we have today, but at the same time, we have privacy concerns because of the information accessibility that we have today. Uh, and so 3D printing in that social context is really no different. 
Uh, and so we are trying to make it more accessible, but there is some level of technical skill required to do it right. And to design parts, to do a good job of that, still requires a lot of engineering knowledge, as I'm sure my machine design students can attest. There is way more to this than just downloading a part and hitting print. There's way more to it than that. So there's, there, it's nuanced. What else? Any other thoughts? What do you think? Aha, very interesting. And so we start talking about money and control. Uh, patent violations. This makes patent violations just absolutely terribly easy. Uh, a patent does legally prevent you from being allowed necessarily to make something that's detailed in that patent, even if you're just building it. Now, if you're studying it for an academic purpose, that might fall under fair use. But if you're making one for yourself and you just say, well, it's a simple device, I can make it for myself, you're, you're infringing on that patent. You can't, you can't necessarily do that. This makes that super easy. And so this is an ongoing discussion from a legal perspective. How do we control that information? You know, in the case of the AR-15, can the Department of State say, well, you're not allowed to have that file? That file is nothing but a list of numbers. Is that not a violation of the First Amendment? <laughs> this, these are sticky issues. This is not just simple, oh, it's just an engineering tool. There it is. You hit the button, and it, and it works. This is, this is actually pretty subversive, and it, it really gets into that discussion of what's okay and what's not in our, in our society. Other thoughts on that? Another ethical issue. We can print biomaterial. This is an ear. This is uh, 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 from Wired.com, an article that they did. These are cells from a, a bovine, a, a calf, a young, a young cow. And they put a sensor in here that's capable of hearing higher than human hearing frequencies. And they've got an electrode. And uh, ostensibly, they could put that ear right on you and eventually wire it into your brain and replace your cochlea. Amazing for people who are having hearing loss, but it also means that you'd be like Superman. You could just like hear through the wall or something. Actually, higher frequencies, you'd be able to hear just a lot of clutter. It's the low frequencies that would allow you to hear through the wall. Sorry, I'm sciencing. So three things that I want you to take away from this. Number one, 3D printing is absolutely amazing. There's awesome stuff that we can do with it. Number two, it is just another tool in our tool belt. And the traditional manufacturing is still really important and will, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we are still doing lots of research and forging and casting and trying to get better at those things. We continue to do that even after doing it for thousands and thousands of years. And number three, it will be an ongoing discussion about how 3D printing and additive manufacturing and that slight removal of the necess necessity of skill to make certain things kind of interacts with our society. So questions. I am done talking at you. You're all saying thank God. Who originally created 3D printing? Who originally created 3D printing? So that's a little difficult to define. I forget the name of the guy who actually kind of invented it first, but he was part of a team that was working on it. Uh, it, it went eventually to MIT. There was a lot of development done there. Um, so it's kind of like saying who designed the GE90 engine. Eh, lots of people. Uh, but there is, there's a name associated with the original idea. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's a great thing to cite. No, I'm kidding. Don't. John. So uh, I mentioned uh, a kind of an overlap between additive and subtractive manufacturing. And forging isn't necessarily subtractive, but uh, an additive process and a, what we call a traditional manufacturing process. It might look like using an additive process to make something with internal voids, with holes that I can't otherwise make. Uh, things like passageways for fluids and oil. And then I forge the outside of that to get the properties that I want. And so I can get the best of both worlds. It takes some design work. But it's something that's, that's possible, and that's, that's ongoing research that we're working on. Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, when the 3D printer was first kind of conceived 30 years ago, what kind of capabilities did it have? Uh, the original 3D printers that they made were actually, my understanding is, and I, I may be slightly off base on this, but my understanding is that the first generations of 3D printers were really pointed toward biomaterials. That's why they went with an additive kind of approach. Um, for a long time, and even in, the, even in the 90s, you had a lot of 3D printers that were really composed of HP printheads squirting out just material 
uh, and, and different materials. And so they were nowhere near as capable as what we're seeing today. As they've hit the mass market, we've seen an explosion of consumer use, and suddenly there's, there's been a lot of industry interest because they're saying, oh, we could do this, oh, we could do that. We've been able to laser center materials for a long time, uh, taking a powder and using a laser to kind of melt it, but then uh, you know, interfacing that with 3D printing in a meaningful way, it's been the last 10 years or so. You have another question? It's really hard to say exactly how, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, the question is, do I think that it's going to expand to become something that's, that's really a huge portion of maybe our manufacturing approach? Uh, it's also a very good question. Um, it's hard to say. It, it's really difficult to say because what we're waiting on right now, and this is, this is just from a 3D printing uh, conference by leaders in the industry, they're saying, we need orders of magnitude more speed and we need better mechanical properties, and we need more predictable mechanical properties. We need an understanding of this material. We've been studying, for example, fatigue in normally uh, manufactured metals for about 200 years. Um, we've been studying fatigue in metals made with 3D printing for about six years. So we've, we've got a little ways to go. But it is, it's coming quickly, and we can study way more fast, or geez, we can study way more quickly than we w were able to in 1840. We could do a lot better research, much more quickly. Do you think um, it would work for contact lenses, where you could get your prescription and then you could either order them or just have like a formula where you could print them? Do I think it could work like contact lenses? It could work like a lot of different things. The question is one of material and cost. So. So the idea would be that if you had a printer, you could just print one. Um, the the question would be, what would it take to get a printer that could print the correct material to the correct tolerances to do that? And right now, that would be cost prohibitive. Um, it would be very difficult to get a machine that can do that and be useful for other things. Very good question. Are you able to kind of tailor the directionality of a 3D printer to make it a stronger part? Yes, and that's an, another ongoing area of research that a bunch of different universities are very interested in called topolo topological optimization. It's that, this idea that based on where I want the strength in the part, I can put strength there. And I can use a computer to figure out where should I have material and where can I take out material because it doesn't matter. And I can do that in three dimensions. Uh, yes, they can do that. Right now, it's a very slow process, but it's certainly possible. So what kind of resources do we have on campus? Uh, so we have, uh, it kind of varies by department. My understanding is that there was uh, some makerspace uh, work that's, that's being done over, I think, in the College of Fine Art. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, there is a brochure over there um, talking about some of our capabilities. We are looking at it in different departments of the engineering school. The Innovation Center has a very nice 3D printer that has a much better material selection than uh, our tiny little maker bot over here that, wow, it's actually printing. Sorry, I don't mean to be so surprised. Um, machines as they are, as anybody who has dealt with machines on a regular basis will know that they do have personalities and they are angsty sometimes. And uh, they'll decide to work or not work no matter how automated we want them to be. But yes, we do have different things on campus. There's stuff in the College of Engineering, there's stuff in the College of Fine Arts, and we're trying to collaborate to really build a culture down here that allows advancement of additive manufacturing. Right. Right. And where do the trade so uh, the question is, what if we could print not just from one kind of material stream, but a bunch of material streams at once, whatever that might look like, whether that's small robots, whether it's a, a single robot with multiple extrusion heads or, or that type of thing. We do have 3D printers in play right now that are using multiple extrusion heads at once to try to speed up the process and to try to lay down maybe different materials. Uh, for example, if we wanted to lay down a nanomaterial inside a structure and tailor the nanomaterials to that structure, we can do that. Uh, if we wanted to lay down a two-part 
uh, polymer where you need a uh, material and then a binder or a reactant, we're doing that too. And so you can change reaction rates to get different properties. Um, there is a lot of stuff dealing with trying to get parallel processes as opposed to serial processes. Serial processes will be, you're going to get coffee, and then I'm going to get coffee, and then the next person is going to get coffee, and that's kind of slow. And that's why we have usually a couple of kiosks open because that establishes a parallel process where you're getting coffee at the same time. And that opens up the, the bandwidth pipeline. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff going on that's going to increase the speed. The problem is it's still a volume-based process. Right now, a forged part, it affects the force that I need, but it doesn't matter whether I'm forging a part this big or this big, I can do it in roughly the same amount of time. Uh, we have to figure out a way to do that with an additive process if we want to make that compete in that way. But there are some really neat things that we can do with that, because maybe this one's laying down steel and this one's laying down copper. Right? And we can do intermetallic stuff. There's all sorts of really neat solid chemistry work that can be done. Right, right, right. So what kind of price range are we looking at for low-end, high-end? So I think this MakerBot was probably in the neighborhood of 3,500. Uh, it's it's three to 5,000 for kind of a desktop model. Uh, the rep wraps can be made pretty cheaply, uh, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars worth of parts, uh, and you can order the printed parts from online. Um, for a high-end uh, metal printing printer, you're looking at a quarter million dollars for just the printer, but it's the material cost. To give you some frame of reference, this is probably about $10 worth of stainless steel, uh, maybe $20, um, to print this much stainless steel just for the powder before you even put it in the printer and pray for, pay for the printer deprecation and the time and all that stuff. Just the powder used to make this would be in the neighborhood of five to $600. And so right now, because it, a lot of its economies of scale, a lot of it is the amount of post-processing that has to be done to the powder to make it printable from metals. Uh, that's the feedstock gets very, very expensive. And so those machines are upwards of tens of millions of dollars on the really high end. Okay, with that, can we thank TJ? I know he'll stay up here and his students over there and there's lots of cool things to look at and he'll stay here and talk to you guys as long as you would like, but I know there's some people that probably need to go somewhere else. Uh, like class? Class, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Okay, a couple of dates. Next week is uh, Richard Vetter for the Cafe Conversation, America's Leaders, You're Harming Our Future, a talk about student debt and failing education. Uh, then October 5th is PhD the movie, the original one at 6.30 and the sequel at 8 p.m. And then in two weeks, um, you get to hear me for the whole hour. Uh, on anatomy of a space flight. For those of you who are wondering how that went, I'm going to talk about it in two weeks. Um, and with that, we wish to thank you again. And uh, please come up and uh, take a look at all this cool stuff. <laughs>